Good morning, church. We're so excited that you're here today. Um, if you haven't been here before, my name is Will Kelly. I'm one of the worship leaders here at Thrive Chapel. Um, we're going to sing about three songs. Uh, Dr. Rice is going to come up and give our message and make about an hour long. Again, let's just worship him today. Let's stand. Let's sing as loud as we can. these songs this week, God just kept bringing to my mind the cross. And I feel like he was asking me, um, do you really understand what I did for you? Um, we're about to sing how I fight my battles. The battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. And I think oftentimes, especially in my life, I'm like, oh, I how, I, I gotta fight, I've gotta push my way through. And I suddenly turn everything that Christ did on the cross and I abandon that and I'm like, how am I gonna do this in my own strength? Which is not what we need to do. He 
roll stones away. We fight on our knees because we have a savior that's already won. He's already gone ahead of us. He's gone down to hell, got the keys of death and raised up. And now what we do is we sing and praise the name of Christ. So I don't know what you all have brought in today. I don't know your struggles. I don't know a lot of your stories, but I know like in my life, I'm struggling with direction. I'm struggling with my kids. I'm struggling and just how do I move forward and serve you, God? And the more that I try, the more that I try to do things in my own strength, the more that I mess things up. So as we sing this song, as we fight our battles, as we see victory, never forget the cross. Never forget what God has done. Never forget that He is going before you and sealing that victory. And our job is to serve, to worship, and shout His name.
saying like we don't know what each and every person is going through today and it doesn't stop us from worshiping our God I was thinking of Habakkuk um, chapter 3 through uh, uh, 17 through 19 it says though the cherry trees don't blossom and the strawberries don't ripen though the apples are worm eaten and the wheat fields stunted though the sheep pens are sheepless and the cattle barns empty I'm singing joyful praise to God I'm turning cartwheels of joy to my Savior God counting on God's rule to prevail I take heart and gain strength I run like a deer I feel like I'm king of the mountain that's going through whatever it is that you might be experiencing in your life. It doesn't depend on your circumstances, whether you praise him or not. He's already won the battle, right? And it's hard to sometimes understand that as we go through life, because we all go through it. So I'd really challenge you this morning. I, I used to sing beside a guy who was tone deaf <laughs> on purpose because I thought it was so beautiful. It was just, I'm going to sing to him. And nothing is gonna stop me. I'm, I don't care if, I feel, if it's humiliating. I'm gonna humiliate myself for my Lord because he finds it beautiful. Because it's about the heart. It's about the heart. So when you praise and you sing, come from that place of, everyone has to go through a hardship in order to have a victory. You have to have a battle to have a victory. So I pray that this morning as we sing this next song. Oh, Jesus. Help us to remember that you have already paid the price for us. Not because of what we do, but because of who you are. Oh. I'm going to see your victory. I'm going to see your victory. For the battle.
we thank you that you are here. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. We all say it together. Amen. Amen. Why don't you turn and welcome the person next? We want everyone to feel welcome here at Thrive. If you're new, welcome. We love that you're here. Take some time. senior pastor right here of Thrive Chapel. We're so grateful that you chose to, to join us here this morning, whether you're a first-time guest or maybe visiting again from last week with Easter. A lot of our regularly scheduled team is, is traveling this week, including myself. My family is back in St. Louis, a young lady who has since grown up, who used to babysit my, my boys back in our home when we used to work for a church in St. Louis, has grown up, become a young woman, is getting married this weekend. So we're traveling uh, to, to take that in. But we've got a great team experience here planned for you. Also want to point your attention towards next Sunday as we start a brand new series in this post-Easter season, especially with the resurrection so freshly new in our mind. We're going to look at a, a series of teachings entitled Scarred for Life. And as you look at the scars that we face in life and that we take on in life, it becomes a mark and an injury that we see for the rest of our lifetime. But just like the scars Jesus took on from the cross, there are scars that are supposed to give us life, to remind us of the life he's given us so that we can in turn give life to others. So let's not take for granted or disregard the hurts and pains that have happened of our past. But in this coming series, starting next Sunday, we'll kick that off and look over the next several weeks of how we are scarred, not just for this lifetime, but to actually give life in this time. But for today, i got a special guest speaker, someone who you know well. Dr. Josh Rice has been with us on several different occasions. He's helped for us to prepare to this point as we continue to look at the landscape of the real estate market to try to figure out our more long-term home for our church family. So he's returned again today as I'm out of town to fill the pulpit. So I'm going to invite you, Thrive Chapel, to put your hands together. Welcome to the platform here at Thrive Chapel, Dr. Josh Rice. All right, good morning, everybody. Are we on here, guys? Um, among the many things I appreciate about Pastor Sean, one is very busy shirts. I don't think I could pull that off, just like he does. It's just always a surprise. Uh, really, bad, really glad to be back with you um, here at Thrive this post-Easter Sunday. I want to invite you, if you have a Bible or a Bible app, please, please, please do turn to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, and I know what you're thinking. Didn't we cover the resurrection last Sunday? Well, I have a neighbor and a friend. His name is Kyle. He is not a Christian at all, doesn't want to be a Christian yet. Uh, I've told him before I die, I will baptize you as God is my witness. We, we're going to figure this out. Uh, but he asked me a question a while ago. It was a really good question from an unbeliever. He said, uh, hey, man, um, how come Christmas is celebrated for a month and Easter is celebrated for a day? It seems to me that the resurrection of Jesus should be a bigger deal to y'all than the birth of Jesus. And I thought, that's a really astute and incisive question. We build up to Easter in about seven days. And we just get a day to dress up and celebrate it. And it never seems like enough. And every year, y'all, I grew up in this stuff. I've been reading the Bible, I suppose, since I was five years old. And every year, I read these stories of the resurrection. There's only four of them. And new stuff emerges. It's just the way that the Bible works. And so I want us to read from the resurrection story yet again, Matthew's account. And I want you to notice something that I never saw before. And that is the focus of the announcement on the geographical location where Jesus will meet his disciples. Let me, let me say that again. It's duplicated. In the passage, there is this focus on the geographical locale where Jesus will meet his disciples. And so the title of my message today is Meet Jesus at the Waffle House in Macon. Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10. 
After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. And the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. And then the command, okay? Then the imperative. Then, then now here's what you do, guys, ladies, in response to this. Verse 7, then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. And the angel's gone. Galilee. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them. This is a headlining moment. The first words of the resurrected Jesus. And he has nothing new to say. It's all about this geographical location. It's all about the ground upon which they will meet up. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid, just like the angel. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Let me ask you something. Have you ever traveled to a, a place that represented a certain time of your life, whether a good time or a bad time? Um, maybe you're a teenager and you remember going to a certain place that represented your childhood, or you're older and you remember going back to your college or something like that, and all of the memories from that place began to rush in on you as if that very place, that classroom, that field, that house were speaking to you. Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. All, all the spaces, the physicality, of creation. This is, this is God's playground. Genesis 1-1, the first verse of the Bible, says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and tells us nothing about the heavens, nothing about what all that was about, but goes into dramatic detail as to how God crafted the physical spaces of the earth. My point is that we Christian folk talk a lot about spirituality. I don't even really know how to define that. I think it's like the immaterial things of God and life, and that's all well and good and important, but you read the Bible, and God's like really into physical stuff and physicality. The, the earth is God's. Um, the great American author, Annie Dillard, says matter matters to God. The spaces, the stuff that God has created are there for us to listen to. So several years ago, I drove by my grandparents' uh, house on my mother's side, and the great town of Soddy Daisy, Tennessee. Anybody ever been to Soddy? You gotta, you gotta work now to find this thing on a map, much less to visit. It's kind of in between Chattanooga and Dayton, in the middle of God's nowhere. And my grandparents on my mom's side, my granddad fought in World War II, came home and lived in Soddy his whole life. He was the mailman there in town. He died when I was in college about 25 years ago. Both of them died. And they had lived in this little green house on a corner that had this stone fence like one you might see in pictures of Scotland. It was just stacked stone with mortar on the top, and it was maybe uh, waist high. And this green house in the corner, as childhood memories go, to me, in my mind's eye, in my memory, it was like the great Gatsby's estate with a yard so big I could run in any direction, hit baseballs as far as I could without them going over the fence. And when I drove by a few years ago on my way to do something at Bryan College, I stopped by. And what I found instead was a dumpy little house in a depressed little town. And I parked my car at the corner and gratitude flooded over me. I, it was just this rush of emotion that I had sat in that porch swing with my granddad so many years ago and that I had shared this space with them. Let me show you something on the screen here that I got to do uh, last summer. This is pretty special. Anybody recognize this? I got invited to one of these fancy galas, these fancy fundraising galas, because they, this organization 
made the mistake of thinking that I had money to give them. If, if I did, I'd be happy to. But one of the shticks at the gala is, you got to get your picture made with the World Series trophy. And after that, y'all, if we can show the next picture, we got to go out on the field there at Truist. And suddenly, I was six years old again. I had tears in my eyes. I felt like an idiot over the trophy. And the, I had to apologize to my wife. I'm like, I just need a moment here. Because some of my first recollections of life are sitting at Atlanta Fulton County Stadium with a hot dog bigger than me. With my dad, you know, when they're like 3,000 people going to Braves games because they were so bad. They'd pay you to go support the team. You didn't even need to buy a ticket. Just show up and somebody would give you one just to get in. And yet being on that field at Truist, seeing the World Series trophy with, with my own eyes, being in the same room with it, it moved me. I was eight years old again. And then there's this house that my family used to live in when my kids were babies. They're in high school now, down in Smyrna, Georgia. Now, I know Smyrna is uh, the up and coming now, but this, is, this, is, this house is on the wrong side of the tracks in Smyrna, all right? This is not like where people are moving in Smyrna. It's in a sketchy part of town, and for years and years, we rented it out until the money, the, the cost of this thing just piled up, and I finally sold it during the pandemic at the behest of my wife, who for a decade begged me to sell that house because it was a perennial money pit and hard to rent. But I couldn't sell it. I just couldn't bring myself to sell it because every time I would go down there to fix something that was broken or to pick up the rent that was usually late, do you know what I saw? <coughs> do you know what I heard? <coughs> I heard the sound of my babies <coughs> reverberating in the walls. I looked around. I had all these memories. <coughs> Excuse me, Kira, I may need a little water. <coughs> this is not emotion. This is just my throat. <laughs> I saw the places where they had learned to walk. And my heart was tied with that space. And do you have stories in your own life of spaces that speak to you? Spaces that bring emotion rushing back to you? Of course you do. And maybe it's because God knows that our hearts are so tied to physical spaces that it is physical space that's at the center of Matthew's Easter story. <coughs> now, I got to tell you guys, I love the angel's announcement to the women, the first announcement of Jesus' resurrection because it is incredibly, <coughs> pardon me, incredibly anticlimactic, which may surprise you. But I want to suggest that even the angel seems to know it. The way the announcement plays out is confusing, it's strange, it's even a little disappointing because here's what everybody would have expected in this time period. Okay, are you ready? This is the announcement that they would have expected. It's not the one in the Bible, but it's the one they would have assumed. They would have expected this. Do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he is risen from the dead and he is on his way to the center of the capital of Jerusalem to show everybody. Run to the temple. Run to the palace of Pontius Pilate. Run to the city center where everyone is. He's going to be in the middle of the action with his nail-scarred hands held high in victory. There you will see him. But instead, imagine the confusion of the women when the angel, aglow with clothes of lightning, says instead, tell the boys to go back to Galilee, and there you will see him. Now, for the uninitiated, Galilee is not the part of the country where anybody goes to become a major global figure. The trajectory of Jesus' life in the Gospels is getting out of Galilee to go and proclaim the message of the kingdom in the capital city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where the action is. Jerusalem is the epicenter of the nation. Jerusalem is the epicenter of prophecy. You, we, we could read Old Testament prophecy after Old Testament prophecy that depicts the Messiah of Israel staking a claim to Jerusalem, revealing himself in Jerusalem. Galilee is not where it's at. 
Galilee is the Saudi Daisy Tennessee of the ancient world. It's a long way from Jerusalem. It's depressed. It's rural. It's a bunch of poor villages filled with poor villagers. In fact, did you know when the Romans wanted to make fun of Christians? For centuries, into the 4th century, 300 years after this. Do you know what they called them? Galileans. It was a cuss word. It, it, was, it was a way to call people uneducated trash. So let me try to put the angel's announcement in our terms today, okay? So to those of us who live in Atlanta, the angel's announcement would sound something like this. Are you ready? Not in the Bible, but we're translating the passage to our day. It would sound something like this. Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And he's gone ahead of you into Macon. Macon, Georgia. Beside the interstate bridge that divides I-75 from I-16. You better stop in Macon if you're going to take I-16 down to Savannah because there ain't nothing for 100 miles. You're going to run out of gas and die of heat exposure. But there at I-75 and I-16, there's a Waffle House on Gray Highway. That's where Jesus is going. And there you will see him. And I love how even the angel making the announcement seems awkward about the whole thing. Do you notice at the end of the announcement, what does he say? Now I have told you. Now I have told you. And he's gone. Look, I, I, he's risen from the dead, and I know you're expecting like some spectacle over the thing. I was expecting that too, but that, he's just going to Galilee, okay? Now I have told you. And he's done. It's like reading an, a statement at a really awkward press conference and not taking any questions at the end. You know, remember that? Remember when Tiger Woods did the press conference after all his stuff, and it was just really weird, and he wouldn't talk to anybody? It's like the angel. Like, hey, don't. Don't look at me, this came down from the top. I read the statement, and, that, and I'm done. That's it. And apparently the message is, is so confusing and yet so relevant, so significant to the story that Jesus interrupts the story for the purpose of making sure that the women get the message. Okay? His first appearance is simply to reiterate what the angel has already said. We would expect something more dramatic than that, but we don't. The, 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 the women are on their way to do what the angel told them to do. And Jesus gives them no information. He stands before them and says, go tell my brothers to go to Galilee. Got it, ladies? We need to be on the same page here. I know when the angel appeared to you, probably had a lot of emotions rushing through your, your brain. And so I've come to ensure that you get the message, Galilee, 60 miles to the north, go there, because that's where we're going to rendezvous, Galilee. So the $64,000 question, why? Why Galilee? Well, Galilee was where they were all from, you know? Galilee's where the movement all got pushed off the ground. Galilee's where they all linked up. Go back to the dirt roads and the quiet spaces and the forever fields of Galilee. Go back to our old stomping ground, to all that was familiar before we were swept up in the great drama of Holy Week. Go to Galilee, and there they will see you. So could it be that this place and this story is something that was not just for them, but also for us? Could it be that the resurrected Jesus seeks to meet you and I, not in Jerusalem, but at the Waffle House in Galilee? I want to offer just three ways that I believe Jesus offers to meet us in Galilee. First, Christ meets us in the quiet spaces of our lives. In the quiet spaces of our lives. Jerusalem is the center of activity and action. It's the center of power, of economics, of culture, of glitz, and of glamour. Anybody who wanted to be somebody in Israeli society, they had to make it in the New York City of Israel. They had to make it in Galilee, a place of constant activity and noise. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't get along with Jerusalem very well? He weeps for the city, its leaders kill him, and he had seen that clash with Jerusalem coming. So here we are today in our own Jerusalem, the suburbs of Atlanta, God help us all, 
one of the most thriving cities in the country. If I don't go to heaven, it will be because of Atlanta traffic. And I will tell St. Peter and Jesus, I'm sorry, you didn't have to drive in it. We know how to stay busy. We know how to fill our lives with noise. We relax by turning on the TV and TikTok and the Internet and just filling our souls with more and more noise. We're addicted to it as a society. Everything's got to be faster, quicker, louder. But Jesus, he meets us in the quiet place. Not in Jerusalem, but in Galilee. I want to show you a quotation from a very famous Danish uh, theologian. His name was Soren Kierkegaard. Uh, and he said this. He said, if I could prescribe just one remedy for all the ills of the modern world, I would prescribe silence. For even if the word of God were proclaimed in the modern world, no one would hear it. There is too much noise. He wrote those words about 200 years ago, believe it or not. Have you ever felt the risen Christ in those rare moments where your life was not full of noise? Have you ever gone out into nature, left your cell phone behind, taken your Bible, and realized there in the quiet place that God was as close as your next breath? See, it's when the noise of Atlanta and life is silenced that we realize God is Emmanuel, God with us. God is closer than our next breath. I love what St. Patrick wrote this very famous hymn entitled St. Patrick's Breastplate, the great evangelist of Ireland. When he went to Ireland, which was very, very pagan and dangerous at this time, this was his prayer. St. Patrick said, Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me. Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. Eugene Peterson famously said, Christ plays in 10,000 places. He, he is with us, behind us, before us, within us, whispering, speaking, but I'm unable to experience that if I can't show up and shut up, if I can't find spaces to drown out the noise, go tell my brothers that I've gone ahead of them into Galilee to the quiet place away from the noise. There they will see me. Here's number two. Jesus meets us in the quiet place, but second, I believe the resurrected Christ meets us in the failures of our past. In the failures of our past. He meets us in our toughest memories. <coughs> memories of self-centeredness, of self-worship, of self destruction, memories of pain that was inflicted upon us that we do not deserve. Let me ask you something. Why are the disciples going to Galilee to begin with? They are fleeing in fear. They are fleeing in fear. They are trying to avoid meeting Jesus' fate. They are hightailing it out of Dodge. And imagine the shame they must have felt to have been running away in fear after Jesus had so boldly <coughs> stood up for them. And yet the angel says, not that they will find Jesus after they have arrived, but the angel says, he's gone ahead of you into Galilee. He's gone ahead of He's made it to your place of failure and pain before you were even there to bring his grace to that part of your story. I have a friend, pretty close friend, who spent several years in, in addiction recovery, and his life was ravaged by addiction. He lost everything, lost his family, lost his money, lost it all. He happened to be a very, very prominent ministry leader in Atlanta at a giant church that many of you would know of. So when it all went down, it was really public. And he was an adjunct professor at uh, downtown where I was teaching at the time a bit. And he told me that he would get nervous going downtown to this place where campus was because it was the part of town where he had gone for years and years to indulge his addiction. And one night he told me after class, we, we would teach these adult ed things from like 6 to 10. So it would be late at night. Um, after class, he told me I, I was just feeling lonely, I was feeling needy, I was feeling isolated. And he pulled into the parking lot of one of those places that he had known well in his former life. And he sat in the car, and the shame of his former life piled upon him, and he was going to relapse. He was going to give in. 
And then he told me, he said, Josh, and something just came over me. And I put the car in reverse, and I went home. What was that something that came over him? I think it was the one who had been waiting the whole time before he pulled in. It was the risen Jesus. It was the risen Christ who meets us in the failure of our past to tell a better story. I, I've got plenty of failures in my past. Do you? I've got some shame in my past. I've got eras of time in which I was hurt by others, and I hurt back with force. Eras in which I withdrew into my own self, and there I lived. And it took a long time, but now I realize that the risen Christ was always there and already there. Already there in the middle of the hurt and the pain and the shame long before I was. Now I can see that I had to be pummeled and formed to learn what he had for me, to learn the pain and the failure. That was a part of the story he's telling through my little life. He's in the parking lots of addiction. He's in Galilee where I am fleeing from him and his memory. And there he calls me his brother. He says, go tell my brothers to go to Galilee. Even when I'm fleeing from him in shame, he calls me his brother. And thirdly and last, Jesus meets us in the mundane. The resurrected Christ meets us in the mundane, in the ordinary, in the routine. Imagine the fireworks that Jesus could have touched off had he shown up in Jerusalem. He could have floated down from the top of the temple full view of the chief priest who declared him a blasphemer. He could have interrupted Governor Pontius Pilate's parade route with his hand outstretched as just as he had calmed the sea. He could have held up his nail-scarred hands for everybody to see, man. Incontrovertible proof, Jesus Christ, superstar. But instead, it's the soldiers, actually, in the story, ironically enough, who go back to the capital city of Jerusalem. Jesus, he just goes back to Galilee to the same old stuff. Same old place, same old dirt roads, podunk villages, same smell, same sights, Galilee, nothing ever changes in Galilee. Just where villagers are going about, living their everyday, average life. That's where the risen Christ makes his home. That's where the risen Christ makes his home. Galilee is this Tuesday morning when the project at the office is going to pot and the coffee pot breaks at the same time. Galilee is just regular marriage when flames all wear off for times. Galilee is changing another diaper and another diaper and another diaper and feeling like you can give your net worth for a whole night's sleep. Galilee's mowing the grass and paying the mortgage and saving up money for that trip to Disney World, for which you will need to mortgage your house, by the way. Galilee's sitting here right now week after Easter. Man, y'all are the faithful. Listen to some guest speaker give sermon you've heard in the last few years. Most of life is not Jerusalem, man. It's not up here. It's not glitz and glamour. It's not even that exciting. Most of life is just plain old Galilee. And when you are there in the mundane place, paying the bills and mowing the grass and changing the diaper and putting money in your 401k, the presence of the one who rose from the dead is as with you. asking you to do, y'all, with all this this morning? Just answer a few questions to yourself. What if you went to Galilee today, this afternoon? What if you turned your phone off and were quiet for an hour and not busy? I think you would develop an awareness of the risen Christ who's been there all along. What if you face the failure of your past, up close and personal? Do you know who you would find there? The risen Christ who's been there all along? What if you opened your heart to his love and action in the most mundane parts of your life? If you invited Jesus, not into what we do here on Sundays, but into just the details of life, where would you find the risen Christ who's been there all along? Christian author, my favorite author, Frederick Buechner, he puts it like this, we have on the screen here. He says, listen to your life. See it for the fathomless mystery that it is. In the boredom and the pain of it, no less than in the excitement and gladness, touch, taste, smell your way to the holy and hidden part of it. Because in the last analysis, all moments are key moments.
life itself that the enemy is fleeing. Fear not. Tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Let's pray together. God, I just pray in this moment that you would meet us. And yet we know how futile and silly it is to imagine that we are waiting on you. Thank you that you're waiting on us. Thank you that everything we experience in life, you have experienced, been there. You are already there, waiting for us. I pray for the person that needs to know your grace, and your healing, that this morning you may open up their hearts to experience you. Thank you for your goodness. Let's all stand and sing together. You take what the enemy meant for evil. You turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. You turn it for good. You turn it for good. chapel.com backslash events. In addition, we have Welcome to Thrive on April 30th. That's the following week. What is it? Welcome to Thrive. First of all, can you, can you raise your hand if you have been to a Welcome to Thrive in here? I see the hands. Okay, if your hand is down, I'm speaking to you. <laughs> all right, see what I did there? All right, so Welcome to Thrive is for people who have been visiting the church. You've been here. Maybe you've already taken our three-visit challenge, and you're like, you know what? I want to find out the back end of the church. You know what? I'm, God's been talking to me maybe about giving. Where does that go? How is that handled? I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about that. Whatever it may be, we want to tell you about how Pastor Sean and Tara had God um, put Thrive Chapel in our heart, why it's here, 
why we do what we do, how we do what we do, join us for Welcome to Thrive. It'll be a lot of fun, and that will be April 30th. You can also sign up for that at thrivechapel.com backslash events. Um, if you're a guest with us today, we would like to give you a gift. Our Welcome Center is out in these doors here to the left. So please um, meet us after service for that. If you have your connection cards, thank you for faithfully giving. If you have your tithes and your offerings, you can put those in the wooden boxes as you exit today. Thrive Chapel, we love you. We thank you for being here today, and you are dismissed. Have a great week. So when I fight.